Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I'm going to continue now where we left off yesterday on the program with Martin, or rather, uh, Richard Bennett's newsletter, The Berean. If you haven't gone to Richard Bennett's website, BereanBeacon.org, and, uh, and to subscribe to the newsletter, shame on you. That's very good, very good newsletter. And this particular one, we're talking about the five basic principles of the Protestant Reformation. Five biblical principles of the Protestant Reformation. Solo fide, that is, faith alone. Solo gratia, which is grace alone. Solo Christos, which is Christ alone. Solo scriptura, which is the scriptures alone. And solo Deo Gloria, that is, all glory alone goes to God. Okay? You're saved by grace through faith, not of works. You're saved by the sovereign will of Almighty God. It's God who calls, God who chooses, God who sanctifies, God who justifies, and God who glorifies. Man has nothing to do with it. Now, we're talking about the particular sola, sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. And we see how uh, the Roman Catholic Church has foisted upon the once Protestant churches the idea that there are dispensations uh, through which God operates, and this particular dispensation of time that we're in is called the dispensation of grace, as opposed to the dispensation of the law, which began at Mount Sinai and ended with the cross. Now, since the cross, we're in the age of grace, the dispensation of grace. Are they mutually exclusive, or do they run concurrently? The law and grace complement one another. The law requires grace. The law drives us to grace because the law convicts us of our sins. All have sinned on one count or another, and sinning, uh, violating one of, the ten, one of the Ten Commandments makes us violators of the whole law. So there are none righteous in God's eyes, no, not one. So we need a Redeemer. We need grace. We depend entirely upon God's grace, which he gives freely to those who receive his Son as their propitiation. And that's what defines a Christian. We don't earn our salvation. We simply receive it as a gift. Christ offered that gift on the cross. He promised it in the Garden of Eden. He gave it at the cross, and we received it. And that makes us saved. Nothing added to, nothing taken away. That's it. The end of the story. So, what does dispensationalism do? Dispensationalism, that which has become the orthodox teaching in all the churches, indicates that there are dispensations, and this dispensation we're in the age of grace, and also it suggests that there is the time of the Gentiles. And they say that that began the time of uh, when Paul took the ministry, the gospel, to the Gentile world, and that that dispensation will end, and then God will return to dealing with the Jews to bring salvation. That God is currently using the Gentile world to evangelize and spread the gospel, and then he will return to the Jews. I don't believe that's scriptural. I believe the, the time of the Gentiles, when it says the time of the Gentiles be come in, I believe that's when Christ returns. That's when the, end, the, the Gentile age will end. 
But the world and dispensationalism, particularly the Roman Catholic Church, has prepared us for a Jewish, a return to the God's use of the Jews to evangelize the world. And dispensationalism presupposes, erroneously, as it is, presupposes that there is a different means of salvation for the Gentile than there is for the Jew. And that the Jews won't receive their salvation until the end of the, t the time of the Gentiles. And so there needs to be a modern nation state of Israel. There needs to be a temple built. There needs to be a priesthood, a sacrificing priesthood, and there needs to be a return to animal sacrifices for the Jew. In other words, pick up where they left off. Rejecting Christ as the, as the propitiation and their lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and begin sacrificing animals again. That somehow that is going to bring about their salvation. But what does the Bible say? In Romans chapter 3, the same question arises. Paul, as a Jew, asks, Are we better than they? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? He then goes on to show that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile before an all-holy God and his holy law, that all have sinned, both Jew and Gentile. Okay, there's none righteous, no, not one, Jew or Gentile. We're all in the same boat. He says, the good news of the propitiation through faith in Jesus Christ's blood is to the Jew and to the Gentile alike. Paul said, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, and the propitiation of, for sin is through Christ Jesus' blood. That's it, for the Jew and the Gentile. So where's the difference? Paul is plainly saying that no Jew has ever, is ever, will ever be saved apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They are saved by the exact same means as are the Gentiles. There's no difference. The good news of the propitiation through faith in Jesus Christ's blood is to Jew and to Gentile alike. It is the same gospel to both. I mean, after all, we know from reading the New Testament that there were many, many Jews that accepted their propitiation in Christ Jesus. The gospel first went to the Jews. The early church were Jewish before the gospel fell upon the Gentiles. They were Jewish converts to Christ. Did they cease to be Jews? Did they become Gentiles by their conversion to Jesus? Absolutely not. The Bible more specifically says those Gentiles who receive Christ's blood are the true Jews. A Jew is not a Jew who is what do outwardly according to the flesh, but inwardly according to the Spirit. So there are many, many, many Gentile Jews because they believe in Jesus. That's what makes them a Jew. And now it's clear, it's obvious, inarguable, that the point is well made. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. So what is all this talk about a dispensational time of the Gentiles and then God taking the gospel back to the Jews, a dispensation of the Jews to evangelize the world. It's not biblical. It's man-made. It's a man-made teaching. It's a man-made teaching that I was forced to learn all my Christian life because it's become the orthodox teaching in all the so-called Christian churches, but it's not biblical. Sola Scriptura. That was the triumph call of the Protestant Reformation, the Scriptures alone. But if you believe in dispensationalism, you've departed from the Scripture. 
You've taken up the rationale of men, the scholarship of men. It's man-made, and it's contrary to the Scriptures. So it is a lie, isn't it? Dispensationalism is a lie. And don't you know that it runs, it's, it's absolutely necessary for this in order to believe that Daniel's 70th week prophecy will be future? That's what they want us to believe, that Jesus was not the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, that there must be a future fulfillment, and if there must be a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, then Jesus is not the Messiah. The Messiah is someone else coming at a future date, and before he comes, the the Jews must be restored to the land, a temple built, animal sacrifices reinitiated, and then a covenant by the Antichrist for seven years. And in the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven-year period of time, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Then the world will be convinced that whoever that is, Mickey Mouse or Donald Trump or anybody, breaks that treaty after three and a half years, then the whole world will be convinced he is the Antichrist. And then it'll be time for the new Messiah. And you better believe the one they're preparing the world to to receive is not Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago, making him the indisputable Messiah of God. And it's that same one who perfectly and completely fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, it's that very same one that's going to come back. And who will he, what will he find when he returns? The whole world worshiping and obeying a false Christ. The Bible does not preach dispensationalism. The Bible does not preach a return to the Jews. It preaches the end of the, of the times of the Gentiles. And I believe, since there's no future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, it was fulfilled once perfectly and completely by Christ 2,000 years ago, then Jesus is the Messiah. It will be he who returns, and when he returns, he'll find the whole world worshiping a false Christ. And who will that be? Well, the one who authored futurism in the first place, the Roman Catholic papacy. Now, we've covered that over and over and over again in this, in this, in this broadcast. How in the 1800s, the Jesuits started foisting this idea that the 70th week of Daniel was not fulfilled by Christ, but will be fulfilled by a future antichrist some 2,000 years after Christ. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land, a rebuilt temple, and animal sacrifices, a seven-year peace treaty. In the midst of it, it will be broken. The Antichrist will be then revealed when it's been the papacy all along. And then once he is done away with, then the stage is open for the returning Christ. And you can bet your bippy they're planning on it being the Pope. Dispensational absolute necessity for this future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. It's all a lie from stem to stern. And we know it's a lie because Paul said there is no difference between Jew and Greek. We're all saved the same way. We are together, Jew and Gentile, a new man in Christ. It doesn't say a new men in Christ. New man in Christ. So what do we do with dispensationalism now? Pitch it right where it belongs. 
in the can. And don't ever dig it back up. Romans chapter 3, the same question arises. Paul, as a Jew, asked the question, are we better than they? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? He then goes on to show that there is no difference in verse 22 between the Jew and the Gentile before God's holy law. That all have sinned, both Jew and Gentile, verse 23. The good news of the propitiation through faith in Christ's blood, verse 24, is to the Jew and to the Gentile alike. Now, if this is true, if Paul told us the truth, and we know he did, what business would a Jew have to return to animal sacrifices? If, if he received Jesus' blood as an atonement for his sins, why in the world would he sacrifice an animal? By the same token, you would ask the question, if the Roman Catholic Church has received the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ, why every day would they offer another sacrifice for for to receive grace? Why would they offer the Mass? Why would the Mass be the central crowning jewel of the Roman Catholic Church? To make a sacrifice, whether it be of an animal or of a man-made piece of bread, is blasphemy. It's a denial that Jesus was the Christ. It's a denial that his blood atoned for our sins. What, what God-fearing, Bible-believing Jew or Gentile would participate in another sacrifice? As if Christ's sacrifice was not sufficient. The truth of the matter is, they wouldn't. And those who return to sacrifices, whether it be one on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church called the Mass, or whether it be an animal on an altar in Jerusalem or anywhere in Israel or anywhere in the world, is blasphemy. But that's what the whole world is praying for to happen. The Jews building a temple, beginning animal sacrifices again. And the ecumenical movement demanding that the Protestants, who have renounced their Protestantism by believing in a future Antichrist, must now come back to the Roman Catholic Church and participate in their sacrifice, the Mass. You see, Satan doesn't care whether you're Jew or Gentile. He wants you all condemned lock, stock, and barrel by participating in a false sacrifice, denying that which Christ performed 2,000 years ago, denying that he was the Christ and that you must return to sacrifices. Jews is just fine with the Roman Catholic Church if they want to sacrifice animals. It's just fine if the Protestants want to come back to the Roman Catholic Church and sacrifice a piece of bread. Rome doesn't care, Satan doesn't care, as long as they participate. Because in their participation, they are in actual fact denying that Jesus was the Christ. They are denying that Christ's blood atoned for sin. They are denying that Christ was the Messiah. That's their whole business. That's the intent and purpose of dispensationalism. That's the intent and purpose of futurism. That's the intent and purpose of the creation of the modern nation state of Israel. That's the intent and purpose of persecuting the Jews in Western Europe, driving them down there in the first place. And that's the intent and purpose of all this talk about Israel today and about a temple and about sacrifices. They want to bring about Rome's version of the 70th week of Daniel, as if it had not already been fulfilled by Christ 2,000 years ago. I hope I'm making sense to my listeners. I've talked about this ad nauseum for 10 years here on Inquisition Update. And as much as I talk, you wouldn't believe, but a handful of people have written me and told me, I'm getting it. Are you getting it? 
If so, please, it's the only payment I get for doing this program. Write me and tell me. Are you getting it? Is God opening your eyes through the study of the scriptures and of history? Is God opening your eyes to the truth and to the deception of the Roman Catholic Church? To the deception of futurism? The deception of dispensationalism? Listen, I may be the only voice you'll ever hear. At least in this generation, on this network, besides Nicholas, to tell you the truth. It's a very, very small voice. But I expect that it will be consumed by those who God has called to the truth. And that God will find men who are not so proud as to admit they have been completely deceived and have repented of that deception and are willing to take God on His terms and accept the truth and live according to the truth and speak according to the truth and spread the truth. It's the greatest gift you can give a brother in Christ is to show him how he's been deceived and used by Rome to regurgitate all these lies as though it were truth in order so that Rome can present to the world a false Christ. I've been used. I've been lied to. Satan is a subtle beast. I've been lied to, I've been deceived, and I've regurgitated all those lives for most of my life. And God mercifully gave me the truth. And not just me. There are many people coming to the knowledge of the truth. How futurism is a lie. Dispensationalism is a lie. A future 70th week of Daniel is a lie. The nation state of Israel as it exists today is a lie. It's a deception. It's part of Satan's deception for the whole purpose of presenting to the world a false Christ. First a false antichrist, then a false Christ. Richard Bennett helped open my eyes. For that I'll be really grateful. And this email, this email newsletter, the Berean, is, uh, is an, ex an excellent e a email newsletter, and I hope my listeners will subscribe. Richard Bennett continues. He says, the central message of Ephesians chapter 2 is that both Jew and Gentile are saved by grace through faith. That is, the unmerited favor of God through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That both are one new man in Christ. See verse 15. For the, for the partition that separated Jew and Gentile has been broken down. But now in Jesus Christ, we who sometimes are afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Who is it that would re-erect that wall between Jew and Gentile that God broke down? Rome. So she can fulfill her phony 70th week of Daniel. We knock down that wall again. Rome is toast. We'll be back right after the message. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Yuji. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, cross the border, dot org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Back from the break, you're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support First, or rather, if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors this program. I don't get paid for what I do, and I don't pay for what I do. Nicholas has seen fit to give me the airtime. It costs him money, and my listeners can help defray the cost of Inquisition Update by supporting First Amendment Radio. All I want is your prayers, continued prayers, and uh, I thank you in advance for keeping me in your prayers. Now, before the break, we read this, but now, in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometime were far off, you Gentiles, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You're brought close. You who sometime in the past were far off, outside of the commonwealth of Israel, you now are made nigh to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Salvation has come to you. Okay? You're no different than the Jew now. For he, Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, has made both Jew and Gentile one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Christ, God himself, broke down the wall of separation between the Jew and the Gentile. We are now all one in Christ Jesus. 
We have but one salvation, one sacrifice, Christ Jesus, 2,000 years ago. He is our Lamb, all-sufficient, has made peace between us and God, and it was a gift, and we received it, and we have joy in it, and we love our fellowship, you and Gentile alike having one mediator, one savior, one salvation, one great high priest, one propitiation. And there's no participation, there's no partition between us. No separation. There's not even a line in the sand between us. God erased all of that. Through the blood of his son, he erased all of that. So who benefits by building a partition between the Jew and the Gentile? Who benefits by putting that wall of separation once again between the Jew and the Gentile? Certainly not God. It was God who erased it. So who is putting it back up? Well, the answer is simple. Man. Which man? The man of sin in Rome. Because without that wall of, particip- of, of partition between the Jew and the Gentile, a future 70th week of Daniel, a, a modern nation state of Israel, a temple in which to conduct animal sacrifices for the Jews, makes absolutely no sense at all. If the world doesn't no longer, doesn't any longer believe in dispensationalism, that God is going to move from the Gentiles back to the Jews, thus requiring that wall to be rebuilt, Rome can't credibly foist upon the world, continue to foist upon the world a future fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. You see, if we believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, there's no future one. And if there's no future one, there's no need for a modern nation state of Israel. We have Christ, the propitiation for all Jew and Gentile, There's no need for a wall to separate us. We are one in Christ Jesus, both Jew and Gentile alike. The Jews have their sacrifice just like we do. It's Christ Jesus. The kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. We don't need our own homeland for the Jews, do we? We certainly don't need a temple. And we most certainly don't need to redo animal sacrifices again. What's Rome going to do if we tear back down the wall that Rome built between Jew and Gentile, if we dispel as a lie dispensationalism, how is Rome going to credibly redo the 70th week of Daniel in order to present to the world a false antichrist and then succeeding him a false Christ? It can't happen. Because if Gentile and Jew mutually come to the decision that Jesus was the Christ, the perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago, we are all saved in that one shed blood of Christ. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Then the Jews would be happy to live anywhere, wouldn't they? They would be happy not to have a temple anymore, wouldn't they? Because they, like us Gentile Christians, would be the temple of the whole uh, of God, wouldn't they? They would be like us Gentile believers, living sacrifices, wouldn't they? All of a sudden, they'd be happy to leave Israel and come live with us and worship Christ together, wouldn't they? They would certainly not need a temple. And they would most certainly not need an animal sacrifice, nor a sacrificing priesthood. So how how would Rome credibly fulfill the future 70th week of Daniel? It would be impossible. It would be impossible. 
Now, I can't remember exactly what page it's on, but in the book that we read here years ago on Inquisition Update called The Vatican Billions, Admiral Manhattan, the author of that book, was in consultation with a, a high-ranking intelligence official from the Soviet Union back in the day when there was a Soviet Union. And Avril Manhattan said something that struck me like a brick in the forehead when he said that if Israel, the Jews, ever get together with the Protestants of America, the Protestants of America, Rome's toast. Did Avril Manhattan have the understanding that I just imparted to you? I believe he did. Somehow. I believe Avril Manhattan knew that if we ever broke down the wall between the Jew and the Gentile Christian, Rome is toast. The Vatican is toast. The papacy will never be accepted as the Christ in this world, nor the vicar of Christ in this world, because it all depends upon the credible fulfillment of a future 70th week of Daniel. And if the Jew, like the Gentile, together come to the reality, the biblical prophetic historical fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago in Christ Jesus alone, Rome is toast. We can defeat Rome without a fight. No blood needs to be shed. A peaceful abandonment of the Antichrist and a peaceful elevation of Christ Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. We have our Christ in Christ Jesus. And it's not the Christ that is worshipped in the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church at that point becomes a cheap counterfeit that even a child could identify correctly. Do my listeners understand what I'm saying? Do you understand how futurism and dispensationalism work together to make a necessity for the rebuilding of a wall between the Jew and the Greek as if there's one salvation for the Gentile and another for the Jew? Which you know runs directly counter to what is taught in the Scripture. Do you understand how futurism and dispensationalism are absolutely necessary to justify a modern nation state of Israel? And how it justified persecuting the recalcitrant Jews in Western Europe by bitter and bloody persecution over two world wars, the First World War and the Second World War, to force them back to Israel in order to fulfill death the papacy's future 70th week of Daniel. Do you comprehend that the main purpose of World War I and World War II, despite anything and everything you've ever been taught in the media or the churches or the schools or anything else, was to force the European Jews back down to Israel just so they could live? And that is absolutely necessary if they're going to have a temple and and a return to animal sacrifices so that Rome can credibly fulfill the 70th week of Daniel all over again with another Christ, a false Christ. Do you understand, do my listeners understand that if if you have to have a future 70th week of Daniel, then you cannot believe that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago as Messiah? Do you understand that if that is the belief, then you're prepared, fully prepared to accept a 
false messiah? Do you see how elaborate Satan's deceptions are? And how so widely believed they are in the Gentile Christian world? Now what if us Gentiles and Jews all come to the same understanding at the same time? Rome would quake in her boots. The walls of the Vatican would tremble to the ground. The papacy would become in the world's eyes precisely what it is, the deceiver, the father of lies. Have I wasted 10 years here on First Amendment Radio? Or are you getting it? Shall I continue another 10 years on First Amendment Radio, or can I retire? I don't want to retire but I don't want to leave one behind. And if I have to work to my dying day, that's what I'll do. If there's anything that I've said so far this morning that you don't understand, that you need clarification about, please ask. I'm begging you to ask. My email address is tom at seawaves.us com at seawaves.us that's s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s just like the waves of the sea com at seawaves.us I would suggest too if it makes you feel better if there's something about my voice or my tenor or my bedside manner my microphone side manner that you don't like and many don't ask Nicholas across the border. Send your questions to Nicholas. I know he's got lots of time. <laughs> Sorry, Nicholas. He'll answer your questions. He can answer your questions just as good as I can. I think he understands this just as well as I do. Well, Nicholas is a little more mild-mannered than I am. Many people prefer to listen to someone like Nicholas. And I bla pra praise God for that. There are two on First Amendment Radio that are telling the whole truth. Pick one. Ask the questions. Be certain in your mind of what you believe. And make sure, make absolutely sure it's consistent with the Scriptures, the Scriptures alone. Solo Scriptura. Don't believe in the false fables of men. Especially not the fables of the false Christ in Rome. Richard Bennett continues, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down that middle wall of partition between us. In the same way Peter answered the Judaizers when the apostles and elders came together to discuss circumcision and the law of Moses at Jerusalem. Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Okay? It was Jews who first believed it was Jews who evangelized the Gentiles, and they both believed. There's no wall of separation. We have but one salvation, one sacrifice, one propitiation, one blood. Christ Jesus, the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, right on time, just as Daniel prophesied it. So why do we look for another? Why do we look for a future one? He continues, he says, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us, the Jew, and them, the Gentile, purifying their hearts by faith. Praise God. 
what is now about dispensationalism. Is it not a lie? How about futurism? Is God going to break down the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile in the future? Or did he do it in the past? He did it in the past, didn't he? 2,000 years ago. The same time when the Messiah came. He's the one who broke down the wall of separation. It was Jesus who did that. Is Rome building a wall of separation now? with dispensationalism and futurism so that he, the papacy, can tear down that wall and be the Christ? That's exactly what they're doing. It's a phony do-over of Daniel's 70th week. And it took World War I and World War II to accomplish it. It took the help of the United States and the United Nations all under the direction of the papacy to get this done because it's only the papacy that's benefiting by any of this. The apostle continues. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? Why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, the Gentiles, which neither our fathers nor we, the Jews, were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. We Jews shall be saved in the Lord Jesus Christ even as the Gentile. Verse 22. Isn't it marvelous how Richard Bennett makes a point? And how does he do it? Directly from the Scripture. Sola Scriptura. He lives what he believes. I find no fault with Richard Bennett. He tells it like it is. He took it straight from the Scriptures. Who could find fault with it? So what do we do with dispensationalism and futurism, both of which absolutely depend upon a different salvation for the Jew than for the Greek, for the Gentile? They have to be error. They cannot be the truth. Now, the simple part is, who benefits from dispensationalism and futurism? The papacy, and only the papacy. So now we know who's responsible for the persecution of the Jews in World War I and World War II. They had to make them completely and extremely uncomfortable living in Western Europe. And to save their own lives, they had to demand a homeland for their own, for, of their own. And so Rome gave it for them. Rome with the help of the United States and the United Nations. And now you can understand why I believe and teach that the modern nation state of Israel is just the answer for the final Jewish question. To kill them all. Physically if not spiritually, to get them just like the Romans to eat and drink damnation to themselves and to get the Protestants to help them do it. Do you understand how diabolical all this is? How elaborate a scheme it is? Are you a part of it? Can you continue to be a part of it? We have to break down that wall between Jew and Gentile. We have to evangelize the Jews, tell them Jesus was their fulfillment 2,000 years ago. The one Daniel prophesied and literally made an X on the calendar when he would come. At the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week, it was Jesus, can't be anyone else, and you crucified him. Will you now repent and believe the gospel and join us as true Jews and break down that wall of separation so Rome can't produce a future phony fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel? Will you Jews come to the truth? 
and help us put Rome back on her heels. Tear down her walls and show her to be the whore that she is. How many of the Jews have suffered at the hands of the papacy? Only God knows. But how many Jews is Rome preparing to destroy at this very moment, either spiritually or physically? And what could be worse for the Jew than to receive the Pope as their future Messiah. I remind my listeners of what Jesus said when he was confronted by the Jews. Jesus said, I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. But there's one who's coming after me whose name the Father did not give him who will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Jesus prophesied a national second rejection of Jesus by receiving a false Christ, one who comes in his own name, one the Father did not give him, Jesus was the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. The Protestant reformers were absolutely correct. And we need to return to true biblical Protestantism before it's too late. Abandon the greatest deception since the world began. Dispensationalism and futurism. Solo Scriptura. I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthe